Hear the word of the Lord from Ephesians 5, verses 3 through 14. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of the Lord. Morning, church. <clears throat> My name is Scott, and I am not the church center guy. Uh, I am actually the director of operations here at Sacred City Church, and uh, it's my pleasure this morning to open the word of God with you all. Uh, we are stepping back into our series called American Idols, and I was thinking about it, and rather than take a way of recapping, right, some of the things that Justin has taught us over the last few weeks about idolatry, I thought, let's just get our face in the word and look at the passage that I think probably most clearly speaks about idolatry in the entirety of the New Testament. So if you would, this is not our main text this morning. We're just going here first for a little taste, all right? Would you go with me to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 25? This is what it says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and in the, things, in, the, in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Oh, this is a text that speaks very clearly about idolatry. But let's make sure we don't miss the flow here. Paul starts with the gospel, right? For I am not ashamed of the gospel because of the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. This is good news. And then we learn more about this gospel, right? That the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. And Paul quotes this specific phrase from the Old Testament, the righteous shall live by faith. And we see that believers live by faith in the gospel. This is what we do. Another way to say that would be that we are saved by God's power for God's purpose. But what are we saved from? Well, this text doesn't uh, leave that unclear as either. Uh, this text says that one aspect of what we're saved from is the wrath of God. 
Why do we need to be saved from the wrath of God, you might ask? Well, Paul says clearly it's because men suppressed the truth and worshiped idols. Men exchanged the worship of God for the worship of gifts God has given. Again, we're not talking about little statues that we bow down to and worship. We're talking about idolatry that happens in our hearts, the raising up of a created thing that God has made over and above God in our hearts. And then it gets crystal clear. Look at verses 24 and 25. I'll read them one more time. Therefore, God gave them up after they were suppressing the truth, right? God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. After men suppressed the truth and worshiped, they were and worshiped the gifts rather than the giver. God gave men over to the lusts of their hearts. Y'all, lust just means an inordinate desire for something. It's a desire that's gotten out of control. And the way that the Apostle Paul defines idolatry for us is to exchange the truth about God for a lie and to worship created things rather than the Creator in our hearts. And if we just kept reading to the next couple of verses, the very first example of the outward fruit of lusts of their hearts here in Romans is men lying with men and women lying with women, exchanging natural, God-given relations with one another for these. They've exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Homosexuality, to be clear, comes from exchanging the truth about God for a lie and worshiping created things rather than the creator. So just in case you had any question whether our country really does struggle with idol worship, whether our country is filled with this American idolatry, all you have to do is pull up your Google Cal. Maybe you're not an Apple person, you're a Google Cal person. What you would find on June 1st at the top of your Google Cal is something that we're going to celebrate as a country for the whole month of June. LGBTQ+, you can add some letters in there, it keeps going on. Celebration month. This is what our country celebrates, the very things that God says are the fruit of suppressing the truth and worshiping created things rather than the creator. We have parades for it, right? We have festivals set up in the East Village, so much more. And this is just one example of American idolatry. That's what we're gonna talk about this morning. So before we go there, let's ask Jesus for some help, all right? Will you pray with me? God, I do ask that you would lead us and guide us in truth this morning. Uh, I know that we can get caught up sometimes talking about the lies, but we want to continue to keep our focus on you, the way, the truth, and the life. So through your word this morning, God, would you help us to see the truth that we have suppressed? Would you bring to light the good news of the gospel? Would you help us to turn from our sin, to repent, and to fix our eyes on you, Jesus? We're dependent upon you for your grace that you would lead us and guide us in your word. God, would you work in my heart and through my vocal cords as I seek to communicate this truth. Would you open our eyes and our hearts to see you through your word this morning? And God, would you spur us on to put it into practice in our lives? We do pray for those in our midst who are sick or who are grieving. We pray specifically still uh, for Tona Dean in the midst of of her sickness. Pray, God, that you would use this uh, new treatment to bring about a full healing in her life. And we, God, we pray for each and every person who's grieving the loss of our dear sister, Isla. Would you meet us here this morning in your words? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, here's where we're going, okay? I'm going to just tell you really clearly where we're going. We're going to talk about how sex is good, It's a gift from God. We're going to talk about how sex is not a good God. And then we're going to talk about how to smash the idol of sex, right? We don't just want more information about our idols. We want to bust them up and we want to turn from them. But before I do that, I want to make sure that we fully understand just how incredibly saturated our country is with the idolatry of sex. It is far gone, y'all. As I prepared for this sermon, I've done a good amount of reading and have found some jaw-dropping statistics. 
I already mentioned the way our country celebrates idolatry in the form of Gay Pride Month, but some of us don't realize that the LGBTQ plus is starting to include even more. Now you've got minor attracted people, AKA pedophiles who are a part of the plus. This is a part of what people will be celebrating in the month of June throughout our country. Hookup culture has fully saturated America as well. One study done almost a decade ago, so it's probably even worse than this now, by Adam and Eve found that 70% of Americans admitted to hooking up at least once for a one night stand. 70% of our country, y'all. And then we've got the porn industry, right? Porn coming from the Greek word porneo, which means sexual immorality. We're gonna dig into that this morning. It's out of control. In 2023, the adult pornographic websites industry, this is just the stuff on the web, y'all, in the United States was on track to match the revenue of the NCAA at $1.15 billion. That's just in our country. And last year, one specific porn site was the fourth most visited website in the United States behind Google, YouTube, and Facebook. It totaled over 2.14 billion visits during a single month in 2023, more than Instagram, Netflix, Pinterest, and TikTok combined. Data from the National Library of Medicine, right? This isn't a Christian organization. The National Library of Medicine says that the United States has a porn-demic. It's like they said back in the day at NASA. Houston, no, except not Houston, right? America. We have a problem. And since our idolatry is out of control in this area, I think it's important that we just go back to the basics. So if you would, go to the garden with me, okay? Let's go back to what God started, how he started things in creation. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 is really clear. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air or heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. Very clear, cut and dry. God created us male and female. If you're a male, you're gonna be a male for the rest of your life. You don't have any say in that. If you're a female, he created you a female, you're gonna be a female for the rest of your life. You don't have any say in that. And then this is what he says. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This command was made before the fall of man into sin and no guilt whatsoever is attached to it. And just to be clear, be fruitful and multiply means making babies. And this is the point where I would give you the heads up that if you didn't know that this is what we were gonna talk about this morning and your kids are sitting next to you and you're a little bit uncomfortable right now, it would be okay to take them out in town to Sacred City Kids, okay? Because we are going to continue to press into these truths. This is what God commanded them to do, be fruitful and multiply. And then if we kept following in the creation account in Genesis chapter two, verses 23 and 24, then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. And everybody said, amen. Amen. One theologian said it like this, one flesh implies both bodily union and inseparable intimate relationship, okay? This is here all the way back in the beginning. One flesh implies both bodily union and inseparable intimate relationship. In other words, what we see from the creation account in Genesis is that sex is a gift from God, a good gift that is meant to be partaken of between one man and one woman who have covenanted themselves, Justin just talked about that this morning, to one another in marriage. And what I believe we're seeing in our country is that even a good gift from God, when taken out of its proper context, can set the world on fire. I mean, you've all heard it said before, right? A fire in the fireplace, it's a good thing. Warms your home, you know, nice and pretty to look at. A fire in any other place in your household, not a good thing. It's horrible. You're gonna have to call your insurance, right? It's not gonna be good. 
Uh, another example of this that I've been thinking about, because this morning I read uh, in, an, in an email that I got about the news, right, that the Boy Scouts aren't going to be the Boy Scouts of America anymore. I grew up a Boy Scout, okay? I'm an Eagle Scout. Uh, so is Kev. We got that going on here, okay? Uh, here's the deal. Even though they're not, you know, they're confused about this. The Bible's not confused about it. But one thing that I learned in Boy Scouts that's worthwhile is that when you set up a campsite, you need to tie off a place where you're going to chop the firewood, okay? If you got your totem chip, okay, then you can go in that little place where they chop the wood and, and you can get out an ax or a saw. You can, you can do some work in there chopping up wood to make a fire. An ax in this fenced off area, you know, if you got 13 year old boys or whatever in that fenced off area, it's a good thing. You can chop up the firewood so you have fire the rest of the night. An ax outside of that area in any other place in the campsite with a 13 year old boy, probably not a good idea. Even, even in where I spend my free time these days, right? On a baseball diamond, a baseball bat in the batter's box or a baseball bat in that on deck circle, it's a real good thing, you know? But the reason these boys wear helmets, you think it's because the pitcher's gonna throw it at them? No, at a young age, it's actually because these boys be swinging the bats outside of those areas and people be getting hit on the head, all right? A baseball bat's a good thing in the batter's box. It's not when it's being swung next to your dad or your mom or your coach or a fellow teammate, all right? You see, the truth I want us to begin with as a foundational truth this morning is that fire in the fireplace, it's good. It's great. Sex within the confines of a covenant relationship, one called marriage, the way that the Bible defines marriage, not the way that our covenant, our culture defines marriage, it's good. Sex was created by God for our joy and his glory. It's one of God's greatest gifts to us, a beautiful, wonderful, powerful celebration of love between a husband and a wife. Okay, I'm gonna read it from the scriptures right here just so you know that I'm telling the truth and you gotta be careful not to get caught up in this, all right? Because it's a good gift. Proverbs 5, 18 and 19 says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. This is the Bible, not me, folks. A lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight, be intoxicated always in her love. And the men said, amen. And I'd read more about it for you from the Song of Solomon, but the word on the street is that back in the day, they weren't having young men read the Song of Solomon until they were full grown men because it is so descriptive about the beauty of this gift that God has given us to be expressed within the covenant bounds of marriage. So I ain't even gonna read it up in here. You're just gonna have to trust me on it. It's good. For most of us, the problem is not a failure, however, to believe that sex is good. Rather, it's, a, it's that sin has caused us to believe sex is God. Like we saw in Romans 1 already, many of us have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. We worship and serve sex or self over and above our creator God, and this is what we're gonna address next. Church, sex is not a good God. It's not what it was made for. Remember, the first thing that happens when we make sex our God is that we exchange the truth about God for a lie. God's wrath comes on those who have suppressed the truth. So surely if we live in this sex-obsessed culture, all of us in one shape or form has probably believed some sort of lie about God because of this. We start to believe lies both about God and about one, or not, one another because of this idolatry. Sacred City Church, let me tell you clear. Our God is a good provider. Scripture says that he has given us all that we need for life and godliness in the person of Jesus Christ. He is not holding out on us. But instead, many of us believe the lie that God somehow is holding out on us, that, that we believe that there's some hidden treasure back there in the cave called sex that he just didn't tell us about the part back there and we're gonna climb in and see for ourselves. God's not holding out on us, church. He's a good provider. It doesn't just cause, cause us to believe lies about God, though. We believe lies about one another in, as well. We saw in Genesis 1 that we're created in God's image, and because of this, we have incredible value and dignity. It's a part of being a human. But idolatry of sex has caused us to exchange many truths with many lies one of them being that attractive members of the opposite sex are merely a means to an end. The lie that many of us have already given into uh, is to see other humans created in the image of God as means to getting the sexual pleasure we desire. This is what has come to be known as the commodification of sex. 
Y'all, Tim Keller once said this. Thinkers have long discerned the difference between a consumer relationship, what's characteristic of the marketplace, and a covenant relationship, the ones we're talking about this morning, which has historically been characteristic of personal relationships, particularly within a family. A consumer relationship is maintained as long as the consumer gets goods and services at an acceptable price. There's no obligation for the consumer to stay in the relationship if it's not profitable. However, a covenant relationship is based not on favorable conditions of value, but on a loving commitment to the good of the other person and to the relationship itself. Social historians tell us that increasingly the values of the market are being applied to areas of human life traditionally seen as covenantal. People now feel free to sever family and relational ties if they're not emotionally fulfilling for them. Commodification is a technical term for a process by which social relationships are reduced to the terms of economic exchange. What I think most people in America have failed to realize is what Justin clearly laid out for us in the introductory sermons of this series. We become like the things that we worship. We become like the things that we worship. And as our country continues to worship sex, the commodification of sex will increase. Think about it with me, church. Men who have made sex their chief end to worship sex become like walking, talking sex organs. They're blown and tossed by the latest desire of their flesh. They have no patience whatsoever. They need to be gratified right here, right now. They're never satisfied. They come back wanting more and more and expecting whoever their partner is to do whatever they've seen on some website that week. They stand at attention for anything attractive that comes their way, but they only have about 10 to 15 minutes or seconds of attention for them because porn has killed their brain and they can't focus any longer than that. We become like what we worship. But it's not just the dudes, right? Women, on the other hand, as they worship sex, are becoming like Jezebels. They've learned to use the commodification of sex to their own benefit. They know that showing some cleavage or wearing tighter clothes or wearing clothes that clearly will never have a chance to cover their whole bodies may help them get what they want. The Bible would say that they're created in the image of God, but they exchange that truth for a lie. And instead of seeing their beauty as inside out, they only think about outward, outward beauty and the image that they're putting on because they think that their power and influence is di- directly connected to that image. To them, increased sexual image is an increase in, in, in influence and power. We become like what we worship, church. And in our text this morning, there's a contrast between believers and sinful outsiders. It's presented in the terms of light and darkness. Light represents not Luke Skywalker, no, okay, but righteousness, life, and a right understanding of the truth. Darkness, on the other hand, is it's not about Darth Vader, right? But a realm dominated by sin and death and a lack of understanding. This realm's foundation are on lies. In our text, we see unfruitful works of darkness contrasted with the fruit of life found in what is good, right, and true. But right from the start, we see how completely opposite this sin is from godliness. Be real clear about this, church. Sexual sin is self-indulgent sensuality. It's all about me and my desires. But if you were to read the two verses before our text this morning, we're called to imitate God in his self-sacrificial love. This is what obedience to Christ looks like. Not about me, but about him. About laying down my desires for the good of others. So if you would have opened up to Ephesians chapter five, uh, we're gonna push toward the light this morning. I'll start in verse three. But sexual immorality... And all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. 
I said we were going to get here. Here it is, sexual immorality. The word in the original language is porneia. It literally means sexual conduct that is not between a husband and a wife in a covenant of marriage. To be clear, Paul is saying that viewing pornography is sin. Paul is saying that masturbation or self-gratification is sin. Paul saying sex outside of marriage is sin. Oral sex outside of marriage is sin. That petting that you do of your partner's private parts outside of marriage, that's sin as well. Homosexuality is sin, and the list could go on. He says sexual immorality and all impurity. When when impurity is paired with sexual immorality in the text, it it literally means unrestricted sexual behavior. Fire outside the fireplace. And Paul says that's sin as well. Note that Paul calls the Ephesians to go beyond just not doing these things. He says they must not even be named and they are improper among God's holy people, among the saints. Paul isn't talking about setting a line, right? Like so many of us do. Like we pick this line. Here's where we think purity looks like. And we're not just going to, you know, we're going to go all the way up to that line, right? Paul's not doing that here. He's saying this isn't even good to talk about. Paul's calling the church to repent, to turn in the opposite direction, to pursue Jesus over and above sex because sexual immorality is not fitting for a saint or a person who finds their identity in Christ. It comes back to our very identity, church. And then he goes on, let there be no filthiness, no, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. And I don't have uh, time to address all of this stuff about the way that we talk, but I want you to note that thanksgiving is a part of the antidote found in the good news of the gospel. It's about being thankful for what he's given us, that he truly has given us all that we believe for life and godliness in the person of Jesus Christ. And I think so many of us that run to sex as our idol don't believe that Jesus has everything that we need in him. We need to be thankful in our hearts. And then he goes on in verse five and six. He says, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Church, these are two of the most severe warnings found in the New Testament. This is like when the National Weather Service comes on, feels like every other day right now, right? To interrupt your regularly scheduled programming. You know, you're like, okay, I gotta listen. If this guy's on TV, it must be important. This is one of those kind of warnings. These warnings are meant to motivate us who are in Christ to heed Paul's teachings that preceded them. Paul says that the consequence for sexually immoral, for the impure and the covetous, are exclusion from the kingdom of God and experience of the wrath of God. Keep in mind that in uh, chapter one of Ephesians, Paul has already addressed and assured believers in the gospel of a secure hope of a forever future. That's not uh, up and up for grabs for us if you're in Christ. But here he is saying, we are not to live like unbelievers who do not share the hope that we have in Christ. If you're living in ongoing, unrepentant, idolatrous obsession, these two verses alone should be enough to wake us up and help us to see the importance of turning to Christ, who is the light of the world. And we're gonna get there in a moment. We gotta keep pressing forward in this text, all right? Look at verse seven. He says, therefore, do not become partners with them. These unfruitful works of darkness are so serious that Paul encourages Ephesian Christians not to become partners with these sons of disobedience in what they're doing. What's he saying here? Well, he is clearly saying, don't become sexual partners with them. Scripture is clear in multiple places that you're not supposed to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. But he's also not saying not to associate with people that are sex idolaters. I think we'd have a hard time in our country going about uh, not associating with any of those folks, okay? That's clearly not what he's saying. But Paul is saying something here. The word partners in, in the original language, to partner with them, 
is referring to sharing in possession or relationship. Paul's telling the church not to share with the sons of disobedience in their immorality. And since their immorality is more than just the sexual acts that they're doing, we have even more to talk about here. I think there's a number of ways that American Christians partner with American sons of disobedience, but there are a few that I want to be sure to mention here specifically. Y'all, viewing pornography in any form is partnering with the sons of disobedience. Let me be clear. Not only is viewing pornography sin, not only does it kill your brain and it's immoral, but it puts billions of dollars into an industry that is killing our country. And not only does it put money back into this sinful industry, it also has created a whole nother industry called human trafficking, where they're stealing stealing young men and young boys and girls out of their houses and sending them to wherever they can be sold as a commodity for people's pleasure. This is what you're partnering with when you're watching pornography. Second, being an ally Uh, I don't even know if they include it in the A anymore, in the LGBTQA, however many letters there are, plus movement is partnering with the sons of disobedience. Let's be clear, this movement has no Godward momentum whatsoever and should not be partnered with. We've already seen it this morning in Romans chapter one that homosexuality is a sin and we've already seen in Genesis chapter one that God created us male and female. We don't have much to say about that. To ally with lesbian, gay, or trans people, Paul says, is sharing with them in their immorality. And now that plus keeps expanding. And what you don't know is that you're allying yourself with people who identify as dogs, people that identify as cats. Uh, I mean, I literally saw a whole table of people with like four foot long tails coming out uh, their pants in Iowa City when we were at a baseball tournament last weekend. And I just lived in Iowa City a year ago and I'd never seen anything like that. And now it's like, these, these, this was not a joke. These, these kids were not joking around. They weren't laughing. They weren't chuckling as they looked at each other. This is who they thought they were. This is what we're allying ourselves with. And the rest of our text is gonna teach us how to smash this idol of sex. You ready for that part? So how do we smash the idol that so permeates our culture? Well, I think we do it in three ways. First, we gotta remember who we are in Christ. Second, we need to learn how to flee, church. And third, we gotta go on offense, not merely on defense. So see it in the text with me. Look at verses eight to 10. For at one time you were darkness, doesn't, it doesn't say you used to be in the darkness or you used to uh, do dark things. It says at one time you were, this is your identity, darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. It says walk as children of light for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to do what is pleasing or discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Hear now the good news of the gospel, Sacred City Church. The gospel changes a person's very identity when they put their faith in Jesus. Before Christ, you were darkness. On this side of Jesus in Christ, you are light. There's a story out there about an old theologian who before becoming a Christian, laid with a prostitute quite often. And one day, this prostitute saw the theologian, now a Christian, out on the street, right? And and she cries out to him multiple times saying, sir, it is I, sir, it is I. To which he exclaims and responds to her, yes, but it is not I, right? There's some truth there embedded in that story that, that, that is very true down to the core that when we go from being darkness to light, there is something at our core that changes that, that is pressed out. We're no longer the darkness anymore. We are light in the Lord. When our identity changes at a heart level, at a root level, And then the fruit's gonna change too. And the scripture here says that the fruit of of light is good, right, and true. And this is how we discern what is pleasing to the Lord. We start with our identity. If we are light, then what's gonna be on the fruit of our lives are, are things that people do in the light. 
not the things that people do in the dark, right? If what's true of us in our identity is that we are children of God, then the things that we should see in the fruit of our lives should be pleasing to our Father who is in heaven. If what's true of us in our identity is that we have been bought with a price, then what we should see in the fruit of our lives is us serving our master and our Lord, our King of Kings, Jesus Christ, with everything that we have and all that we are. And then when we look to see what the scriptures say about how to walk that identity out, whether that be just in the bedroom or in the kitchen or wherever, one helpful grid for thinking about this that was introduced to me through some premarital counseling materials is a simple question, can I worship Jesus while doing this? Y'all, can I, can I worship Jesus while viewing pornography? Can I say it? Hell no. That is not true. You cannot partner with this industry and be in obedience to Jesus. You cannot do that in worshiping Jesus. Can I have sex with my wife while worshiping Jesus? Yeah, I can. That's the grid we need to be thinking through. Can I worship Jesus while this? And if you can't, then it's probably an unfruitful work of darkness. And if you can, then it's probably the fruit of light. The second thing that we need to know about smashing the idol of sex is not just remembering who we are in Christ, but we need to learn to flee. You see, sexual sin's different than other forms of sin. Other forms of sin, we're told to fight them, but with sexual sin specifically, we are told multiple times to flee. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other person or sin a person commits is outside of the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. There's some redundancy here, but see 2 Timothy 2, 22. So flee youthful passions, and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. The best example that we see in the scriptures of this fleeing is Joseph. Y'all know the story in the Old Testament, right? Uh, Joseph's the brother uh, that his brothers don't like because he had a dream about him uh, being risen to a really high place. And, and so they're like, well, I thought that was gonna be me. And so uh, they sell him into slavery uh, and uh, he ends up working his way up and he becomes like, uh, a steward in the house of a governor. His name's Potiphar. And Joseph's killing it. And basically the scriptures say that he was given access to everything in this dude's house except for his wife. And he's a good, upright, and godly man. And so he manages the rest of the household well and he keeps his distance from the wife. But the wife, seeing that and seeing how great Joseph is, wants some of what he's cooking. And so she keeps moving in on him and trying to entice Joseph to lie with her. And on one such occasion, when she entices Joseph to lie with her, he does exactly what God says here in his word. He just flees. You see, the thing about fleeing is that sometimes it, everything might not always work out in your favor. That's one thing we got to learn from Joseph's story. He flees and this lady has his scarf and then she tells a different story and, and her story is not true. And, and, and so she gets him caught up and she gets him fired, right? But Joseph did what was right. And the thing that's true of Joseph that, uh, that I love about the story in Genesis is it keeps saying that he was with the Lord. What we see in his life is this designation that he is in the presence of the Lord over and over and over again. Church, if fleeing gets somebody telling some stupid story because something gets left behind, you let God deal with that. You flee into his presence. This is what the scriptures call us to do. You see, in college ministry, I did that for a long season of my life. Uh, this is what I saw consistently. These are conversations I was having with young men on a regular basis, y'all. You see, many ways that young men in our college ministry tried to fight sexual sin oftentimes kept them focusing on their sexual sin, right? Because their attention and their focus was on that sin, eventually they'd, they'd give into it again because that's where he kept their attention, right? Like, hey, people be asking them in accountability, have you done this this week? Have you done this this week? And now they're thinking about it again. However, when we flee from sexual sin and we flee toward Jesus, this is when I saw young men walking in victory over that sin. This worked not because they were fleeing from sexual sin, but because they were fleeing toward Jesus, because they were fixing their eyes upon him. And then instead of becoming like the idol that they were worshiping, they became like Jesus, worshiping him and him alone. You see, I think we need to get good at fleeing, church. But the last thing that I want us to see in this text about smashing the idol of sexual sin 
is that we got to go on offense, not merely on defense. Look at verse 11 to 13 with me. Therefore, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. You see, I believe that if we want to truly see our culture changed, if we want to see our city stop being obsessed with sex and see it look more like Jesus rules and reigns here in the Quad Cities, then one thing that we need to do is change the conversation. Notice Paul didn't draw the line anywhere close to where people in our culture draw the line concerning these unfruitful works of darkness. Paul called the Ephesian church to stop speaking of these things that they do in secret and instead expose them. Church, I wanna testify for a moment. We lived in Iowa City for a really long time. We uh, planted a church there in 2018 that made it about five years. And uh, I, I tell you what, I had an experience in college ministry it kind of shook me a little bit. And I won't tell you the whole story, but there was an experience uh, that I had with a, a student leader. And anyway, it, it boiled down to basically homosexual, uh, homosexuality and him identifying as a gay Christian, which is an oxymoron or whatever the word for it is. Uh, if you put anything in front of your Christian, uh, you're not really seeking Christ anymore. You're doing whatever that amplifying word is. And uh, anyway, the experience that I had with that almost went to the Supreme Court, Okay. Us and one other ministry at the University of Iowa uh, like kept this uh, young man from being a student leader uh, in our ministry because of the sin that he was walking in. Uh, the only, thing, the only like, thing that kept us out of it was I didn't put it in writing. The other, the other college ministry put it in writing. He was not going to be a student leader because of this sin of homosexuality. And honestly, it ended up going all the way to the Supreme Court because the University of Iowa kicked Blick, Business Leaders in Christ, out of being a student organization at the University of Iowa, and then a Christian firm that does all this law stuff in, in um, Washington, D.C., helped fight their case and take it all the way up. And honestly, it, it, like, it, it was kind of traumatic for me. I was, I was like questioned by all these people from the University of Iowa all over and over again, and so were a bunch of our student leaders about who we are, were and what we stood for and all this stuff. And so when we planted... Because the public discourse in Iowa City was so pro-LGBTQ+, for so long, I, I just kept my foot off the gas. I'd say, oh, I'll talk about it when we get to it in the text. But I knew we weren't going in 1 Corinthians, and I knew we weren't going to start in Romans chapter 1. And I knew we were going to, you know. And, and so we just, we just didn't talk about it a lot. We would talk about it when we needed to and when it was in the text. That's what happens, church, when the public discourse in a place becomes so profoundly pro-sin, pro-idolatry, and not the truth, when the wholeness of a community has exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, somebody that has convictions, biblical convictions, ends up saying quiet instead of exposing it. And this is what I think God is calling us to do, is to go on offense, not on defense, not to join with them in speaking about these things as positive things, but instead to expose them by the light. And if we're to expose these works of darkness, then we must not only know what God's word says about them, but we also need to engage in this public conversation, not by speaking about the things that they do in secret, but instead by speaking of the truths that they have exchanged for lies. But just like other idols that we've covered prior to this, y'all, the best offense, the way that we smash the idol of sex is through a greater affection for Christ. And so as we conclude, I wanna acknowledge that this could have been a heavy sermon for some of you. And if that's the case, I especially want to remind you right now of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Church, all of us were created in the image of God. We were created to worship the triune God and him alone. But all of us in one way, shape, or form, scripture says, have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. We've worshiped and, and served sex or self rather than our creator God. And this sin has separated us from God. But God. 
because he's gracious and merciful, church, because he's abounding in steadfast love toward us, sent his son, the light of the world, down into the darkness of our sin-stained earth. He put on flesh and he dwelt among us. His name was Jesus and he lived sin-free for 33 years here on earth. But then even though he himself was innocent, he was crucified between two criminals. Jesus experienced the darkness of death so that all who trust in him could be forgiven and be given the gift of eternal life in Christ. And it gets even better because three days later, Jesus conquered death. He conquered the father of lies and he conquered sin so that when he rose from the grave, we could experience cleanliness. We could be washed clean through the good news of the gospel and be forgiven. Church, Jesus wants to invite you. If you're here and and you're not in Christ, he wants to invite you this morning who have experienced the stain of sexual sin to be washed clean through the good news of the gospel. These are his words in the text. It's almost like he pleads with you, Paul says, as he quotes from this old hymn. Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Eric was getting at it all the way at the beginning of our welcome. We are blind in our sin. It makes us blind from seeing the truth. It it makes us blind from seeing ourself. But Jesus can give you new eyes to see yourself as one who has been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. That's what he did for me when I was 19 years old, stuck in sexual sin on a regular basis. And in one moment, Jesus swoops in and saves me from that and gave me a new purpose to live for him. So no matter what you've done or what's been done to you this morning, Jesus loves you with a sacrificial, self-giving love, and he wants to rid you of the self-gratifying sin that you're caught up in. I'd encourage you to turn to Jesus and find freedom in him. Will y'all pray with me? God, we thank you for your word. Uh, Honestly, we thank you that it cuts. And we thank you for the precision that it cuts with. It's not like a 13-year-old Boy Scout outside of that area chopping wood just willy-nilly with a knife or an ax. It is very precise to get to the specific places of our heart where there is darkness. And so God, we pray this morning that you would open us up and that the light of Christ would shine into that darkness because where there is light, there is no place for darkness anymore. God, would you do a work in our lives that only you can do? Would you do a work in our culture, in our community that could only be traced back to you being worthy of our worship, you being the light of the world. Thank you that you have transferred many of us from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved son. We pray that you would add more to our number this morning. And God, I ask that our MCs and our fight club this week would be filled with men and women walking in the light, exposing the works of darkness, these unfruitful works of darkness and choosing to follow you with all of who they are again. Pray this this morning that you would do this work in our hearts. I ask God also that you would prepare us for the table. Father of mercies, thank you for the gift of the bread, which we confess provides us with the body of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to enable us to eat of it in faith and to be made more fully members of his heavenly body through Christ our Lord. Father of mercies, thank you for the gift of this wine which we confess provides us with the blood of your son, our savior. We we ask you to enable us to drink of it in faith and to be conformed more and more to the image of his death through Christ our Lord. And I I just think of that text in 1 Corinthians and I pray God that you'd help us to examine our hearts before we come to the table this morning. God, help us to repent and turn from these unfruitful works of darkness so that when we come to the table, we once again experience the goodness. We taste and see the goodness of the gospel through your body sacrificed for us and your blood shed for us. We pray all this in Jesus' name.
Amen. Thank you.